Okay, before we get started with this video, guys, the biggest two things that you need to know about running the autopilot on this uh, Steam Gauge Cessna 172. We're going to zoom in to our compass card right here in the middle. The first thing, you need to make sure this compass card is lined up with your magnetic compass. This will uh, precess and do all sorts of things while you fly, so you're going to have to constantly make sure that it is ready to go. You can manually adjust it here with this knob, or for those of you who are lazy like me, if you just want to do it automatically, the default keybind is the letter D, Delta, on your keyboards. Just tap D, it'll automatically align it. So I will do that uh, periodically during the flight. Just tap that D to get it to self-align. Like I said, it will process on its own. It's just something that's built into the sim that actually does happen in real life. You have to constantly monitor that. The second thing that's going to pertain here <clears throat> to our compass card is the fact that anytime we want to track a radial, so a VOR radial or an ILS or even a GPS waypoint, we have to set this, the uh, heading bug here to whatever our desired heading is. So for example, I put a waypoint in the GPS and it tells me that uh, we need to turn to a heading of 210. If I do nothing with this heading bug, nothing is gonna happen with the autopilot. In fact, it may just decide to fly off in some random direction. So in that scenario, we would have to set our heading bug down to 210. It's uh, apparently something that happens in real life they're simulating a real-life deal with this Aztec autopilot. Uh, so I just needed to get those two points out right away. And with that, we can continue with the video. Welcome to another X-Plane 12 video. We are going to do the ILS Runway 2 up into Carl Stefan Memorial Field in Norfolk, Nebraska. We're going to do this with uh, the autopilot and the Garmin 530 stack. I think it's a 530, 430 stack in the uh, Steam Gauge Cessna 172. But before we get going any further, I have a couple disclaimers. Um, number one, I live in Southern New Mexico and it is an absolutely glorious day in the mid 60s down here. Um, so I've got all my windows open. And what that means to you guys is you may hear the sounds of a regular neighborhood in the background. We've got uh, dogs, cars driving by, people playing golf, uh, golf course back behind me. So a little bit of that going on. I'll try to do my best to edit any of that excess noise out, but I'm not going to catch everything. Disclaimer number two. Uh, at one point in my life, I was actually a CFII, a helicopter CFII. What that means is I used to teach people how to fly in the IL IFR system <clears throat> in helicopters. That was my job for about a year until I moved on to something that paid much better <laughs> and uh, where people weren't trying to kill you every day. Anyway, uh, having said that, I am no longer a flight instructor. In fact, I'm no longer instrument current nor instrument proficient. So none of this can be portrayed as actual instruction. This is just BK playing around in a flight simulator. Uh, third and final, this could potentially be about an hour long video, so I'm probably going to heavily edit it out stuff, uh, like our long legs where we're not doing anything. We might just speed that up a little bit. So fair warning there. Um, if there's nothing pertinent to the video, I may speed it up a little bit. Once we hit our initial approach fix down here in Columbus, I'll probably uh, leave everything real time just to show you guys this approach. So. <sighs> that was a little long-winded, but having said all that, we're starting out here with a map to give you guys a better situational awareness of uh, what is going to be going on on this flight. So we're going to depart in our steam gauge 172 from Fremont, Nebraska, which is just west of Omaha, Nebraska. We're going to climb to about 5,000 feet. I chose that altitude because that's on our approach plate over here. So it just makes everything easy once we uh, get established on the approach. Uh, I'm going to use the autopilot to give us the climb and also uh, probably just use the heading bug to uh, fly us out west. Once we hit the 5,000 feet, I'm going to show you guys how to track to the Columbus VOR. 
The reason we're doing that is uh, there's a little bit of a trick on the Steam Gauge 172 in uh, X-Plane. I've noticed in, this in X-Plane 11 and 12. Um, there's a little trick on the uh, with the heading bug on the HSI that you have to know in order to make, in fact, any of this video work. So uh, we'll go over that on our way into uh, Columbus. From there, I'll probably fast forward a little bit. And uh, we will then switch over to using the GPS to, well, the GPS coupled to the autopilot to fly us into uh, Norfolk. So, yeah, the reason, I guess I should point this out. The reason I chose Columbus as our uh, waypoint there is the Columbus VOR is actually our initial approach fix for this uh, ILS. Uh, in past times, I think I've departed from Columbus and caught up that, um, what would that be, that radial? 323 radial, but it's actually a lot easier if you just start out here. Plus, I wanted to show you guys a, that little trick there to make all of this uh, work smoothly. So, enough talking. Let's get in the aircraft and get going. Okay, guys, we're uh, sitting in the aircraft now on a runway at Fremont, Nebraska. So, let's go ahead, since we know we're going to do an instrument approach, uh, let's get the... Uh, GPS setup. Now to simplify things, let's see, will it let me, it won't let me turn this one off, dang it. Let's just ignore the Garmin 430, and we're going to focus on the Garmin 530, this uh, GPS on the top. Uh, I'm not going to worry about uh, comm frequencies or radio calls or anything like that, we're just going to focus mostly on the procedure that uh, I go through in the sim here to, to fly an ILS. Um, the first thing we're going to have to do is change our, basically our nav frequencies here. Uh, right now, we you can see we have the uh, comm block highlighted, and we can change the large number with this large knob, small number with the small knob. In order to move this field, highlighted field down here, you just press like so. All right. Now, I've already got the frequencies that we need um, input here, the localizer for the ILS is 111.5 and the reading off my chart here the VOR frequency is 111.8 actually so I don't have that so we need to change that to 111.8 and then to move this highlighted field to uh, be the active you just press this uh, swap button right here oh, cool it automatically pops up and uh, since you have that uh, highlighted there, it's um, basically verified. So we don't have to go through the whole audio uh, verification and all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, so the big takeaway here is to swap frequencies. You have to do that. And then to swap the highlighted field in order to change the frequencies, like physically change the uh, frequency that you want, you just use the CV button. Now, if we're up here, we can still swap our uh, nav frequencies down there. Um, since we're going to be tracking the VOR initially, we're going to have this in VLOC, our CDI in VLOC. When we move to uh, using the GPS for our navigation, we will have to manually press this button and put it in GPS mode. So just a heads up there. So we're going to leave it in VLOC and let's get off the ground. I think I wanted uh, 5,000 feet and a uh, kind of a westward heading. So I'm going to set the heading bug where I want it. And uh, let's do this. To remember my <laughs> all my keybinds on my yoke here. I haven't played the game in about a month, I think. up. 
airplane flies so, so good you don't even really need the autopilot. <laughs> oh, uh, quick tip here too. If you're flying with pedals and stuff, which you're almost going to need some sort of a rudder input, uh, this autopilot will not do your um, will not do yaw, not do trim on the yaw. So make sure that you're still using your pedals and stuff. If I let go of my pedals, you can see it just kicks us out of trim right away. Let's start a turn over towards our heading bug. Like I said before, we're not going to bother with radio calls and all that stuff. If you really are using this uh, for uh, practice, like for real life stuff, make sure you're, you're doing your radio calls, you're going through your uh, takeoff checklist and stuff, because that's one thing that a sim is really good for, is all the procedural stuff. Uh, just get yourself really uh, balanced, <laughs> I guess. Okay, we're, uh, except we're going to aim for 5,000 feet. And let's see if we can mess around with this autopilot a little bit. Um, the first thing I want to do, it seems like it's already on. There's a little RDY, so it's ready. So I want to track our heading bug. So we've got our heading bug uh, set for a western uh, track there. So let's just hit heading and see what happens, okay? So heading is highlighted, so the autopilot is now flying the heading. And let's see if we can get a vertical speed. So that's showing plus seven. Let's bring that down to five. Let's just do 500 feet per minute. And uh, it's not really pertinent to this video, but you'll see me uh, messing around with the mixture control a little bit here too. Uh, it's kind of a personal thing I like to tweak. Generally, as you fly higher, um, you're going to need to lean the mixture. And as we climb, I'm just I'm aiming for kind of a peak EGT temperature. That is this gauge right here. So I'm just slowly pulling that mixture back until it peaks. And then we're going to push it back forward. <laughs> just a hair until it starts to fall a bit. Whether that's uh, the correct way to do things, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I believe I threw a disclaimer in here. I used to be a flight instructor. I am no longer anymore, so I'm not qualified to give you guys actual instruction. I'm just basically showing you what I do to make this stuff work. Cool, so the autopilot is holding our heading, and we've got a nice 500 foot per minute rate of climb. Tell you what, since we're we're seeing much better performance, in my opinion, than this aircraft would actually provide us in real life, uh, we can go ahead and bump this vertical speed up to 700 feet per minute. The autopilot should handle that. Very nice. Don't have the exact figure, but I think our best uh, climb is going to be somewhere between probably 65 and 75 knots somewhere in there so we're kind of like at a cruise climb speed here one more thing I forgot to note I don't have a video camera on my um, yoke and pedals and uh, like flight crop quadrant and stuff because this video really doesn't pertain to any of the actual flying of the aircraft. We're just working on uh, aircraft systems. So that's why I chose to do that. And it, it makes it a lot easier for me in the end to edit the video. <laughs> so without having to sync the audio, audio and mesh everything together. Um, also, once we get over closer to uh, getting this ILS set up, I'll throw uh, the approach plate up on screen 
and I will also give you guys a link to the actual approach plate in the uh, video description so that you can follow along with uh, what I'm doing if you want to just pull it up on a phone or a computer or uh, print it out even okay so uh, we're about what 400 feet from where we want to be like I said I was aiming for 5,000 feet what I'm gonna do is slowly bring our vertical speed our climb speed down so it should take us yeah, 200 feet about a minute to get up to 5,000 feet from here and basically just time it to have your vertical speed be zero when you hit your desired altitude at which point we can press our altitude hold button and it'll hold it uh, at 5,000 feet or whatever altitude you've chosen thousand feet so boom zero and press your altitude button it is now going to hold this altitude for us I'm going to adjust my mixture again Whoop. right about there and I am going to choose probably I think a 2400 rpm this is my own personal airplane. I'd probably fly around 24 to 2500 RPM in cruise. So we're just adjusting the uh, throttle a little bit here. Keeping the aircraft in trim. Remember, the autopilot doesn't do your, uh, doesn't do your rudder. For the sake of this being a... Uh, a video that I'm going to upload for you guys to, to learn stuff from. I think we'll do 2500 RPM just so we're not chugging around at 90 knots. <laughs> Alright. So we're pretty much trimmed out here at 5,000 feet. I don't need my nav lights on. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. That'll give us a good view of everything that we need. And I will, in a little while, I'll put the approach plate here in the upper left hand corner. Can you guys uh, reference there? So, on our way over to the Columbus VOR, we can see. We have our DME readout here on the Garmin 530, so we're 22.9 miles from the VOR. Let's take some time to show you guys how to track directly to this VOR. Um, we're going to be using this instrument up here, upper right hand corner. This says we're on the 076 degree radial. track to the VOR so oh something like that what was that two five five two five six maybe so all I would do here I'm gonna set whoop, I can't do that just yet sorry I want to give you guys an example of uh, what this heading bug does um, in order for us to start tracking the VOR all we have to do is come down here and hit nav, okay, on the autopilot. But, going to what I said at the very start of the video, if this heading bug is all the way over here, and now it's actually going to work, <laughs> shoot. Um, generally speaking, if the heading bug was over here, it would really confuse the autopilot. But it looks like we're already tracking. 
let's uh, let's try to intercept a, a different radial. Let's say we want to intercept the two five zero radial, but we don't have our heading bug set properly. I think it's actually going to do it for us. Oh. Nope, we've gone and confused it. <laughs> so that heading bug isn't set properly. The autopilot has no idea what to do. So let's let's fix this. Yeah, it's just going to set up a, a, a wrong heading. So we're never going to intercept that radial. So I'm going to get us uh, set up better here. We're going to go back to heading. I don't know if that was a good example for you guys or not, but there we go. We're flying 270, but we want to intercept the 250 degree radial. So from here, we hit nav, but we have to bring our heading bug over to 250. So that's telling the autopilot to fly an intercept course, but our final course that we want is 250. I hope this is making sense for you guys. And I'm not just throwing a whole bunch of crap out there that nobody's really gonna understand. The The key point, I know I keep saying it, the key point is to have this heading bug set to whatever final heading you want. <laughs> but it looks like this is uh, gonna work out good. And I'm going to take just a moment to realign our compass card again. Remember, that's letter D on the keyboard. You can see it moved just a tad bit. So it possessed probably one or two degrees in the time we've been flying so far. The autopilot should be intercepting this radial now. Um, always double check down here that you actually do have whatever you want highlighted. So we have nav highlighted and we have altitude hold highlighted. I'm not sure I gave myself enough time here. Because we're gonna have to get this GPS uh, approach set up. Tell you what, when we hit uh, 10 miles from the uh, Columbus VOR, we have a DME. I'll go ahead and show you guys how to set up the approach. <clears throat> In fact, let's go ahead and do that now. While the autopilot is trying to track into this VOR, let's get the approach set up to the Garmin 530. So, uh, first thing that we're going to do, tell you what, let's do this. If you just click on the GPS, bam! It'll bring up a uh, big one for you here. This will make it easier. So I'm going to hit direct to, because we need to put the airport in that we want to select the approach from. So we're going to go direct to, and the little button. So the little button will change what's highlighted, and the big button on the outside will uh, change which one is highlighted, if that makes sense. So I want K. O F K hit enter and activate okay so we, we're still in VLOC so the autopilot nothing's going to switch over we're still tracking the VOR uh, but to get our approach loaded we're going to hit the procedure button we're going to select an approach hit enter we want the ILS-02. If you wanted something else, you can use this little button to, to cycle through. But ILS-2, so we're going to hit Enter. And we want to go to OLU as our inner, uh, initial approach fix. That is the Columbus VOR. So we'll hit Enter. 
And let's go ahead and activate. You can load it and then activate it later, but I want to activate it now. I'm curious if this is automatically going to bump us into GPS mode on this uh, CDI here. Okay, it did not. So it uh, bumps us over to the flight plan page once we activate the uh, approach. All you have to do to get rid of this and go back to your map is hit FPL, and that'll bump you back. But now that we have this approach loaded, why don't we switch our CDI over to GPS? And remember, we have to change this to our heading bug to 256. 254. A direct track right here. 254. So make sure your heading bug is on the 254 degrees. Tells you to set course to 254. Um, oh, I'm stupid. See, I, I made a mistake. I have it on 24 something. There we go. That's why, see, even though we had it all tuned in properly and we have it in nav mode, it didn't know what to do because I had the wrong heading bug in. Uh, sorry, I had the run, wrong heading with the heading bug. Okay. Oh, I'm like, something's not right here. But that's a perfect example of, once again, you have to pay attention to that heading bug. Otherwise, your autopilot is not going to know what to do. So this should now uh, re-intercept. <laughs> Crazy. And since we're no longer tracking the OLU VOR, let's go and change our uh, nav frequency over to the ILS frequency. We'll just hit this uh, number here and swap. And I'm also going to get rid of this big GPS now. So we can do everything else on the uh, small one. That's kind of a neat feature, though, to be able to tap that and have uh, quick access to it. I can't believe I've already screwed this up. <laughs> I've also not flown this approach in probably about a year and a half to two years, so <laughs> we're, we're going to stumble through a little bit of this. You can change the uh, map range here. If you want to zoom out, you, you press the uh, upper button if you want to zoom in for better detail press the lower button generally if I was going to do this approach I would probably be in the five nautical mile range right here okay I'm not sure what the uh, GPS is going to do for us when we hit uh, hit the VOR, it should automatically take up the next track. I think it's going to be a heading of 323. But we will once again have to set our heading bug over to 323, and I think it'll uh, it'll give us a warning here. Otherwise, it's going to just keep flying straight, <laughs> or give us some wacky heading. Select appropriate frequency for approach. 111.5. And that's what our approach plate says, so that's what we're gonna go with. I do apologize if I just keep rambling here. I'm on my second Red Bull, and I'm doing something that I really enjoy, and I'm also getting to share this with you guys, which gives me even I don't know, more joy. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead, before we start this approach, I'm going to align my compass card again. Here we go. That's maybe a degree off. Alright, 
So we're coming up to being about a mile away from our uh, waypoint here. It's going to give us a warning at some point to set our course what I, to what I assume is going to be 323. Like I said I haven't done this approach in a while. Zoom in if you want. Oof, we're getting awfully close. All right, three, two, seven. There's three, twenty. Three, two, seven. Well, that says three, two, eight. So I'm going to, yeah. Now it says three, two, eight. So I'm going to uh, do one more to three, two, eight. I hope this is making sense for you guys. I really do. That uh, there's a direct correlation between the heading bug and getting the autopilot to track either radials or uh, GPS waypoints like this, or GPS courses, I should say. Alright, so the next unknown coming up here, we got nine and a half minutes until we hit it, but uh, when we hit the Slays intersection, I'm not sure if the GPS is going to try to push it into a hold, or if it's going to uh, just turn us right onto our final approach course. <laughs> so we might have to fumble a little bit there. The approach plate says no PT, which is which means no procedure turn. So I'm assuming it's just going to turn us right onto our final approach course. But you know what happens when you assume. <laughs> Other than that, we don't really have much to do for about eight minutes. When we get closer to that uh, Slays intersection, I'll probably... I'm going to slow the aircraft down to about 80 knots. We have much more manageable speed. Just going to check my text messages here. <laughs> I am a little worried that this has us on a 328 degree. Uh, heading. Because my approach plate clearly says 323. I'm curious if this is going to take us to Slays or not. Um, another thing too, the nav database might be off a little bit. This may have a, a previous version of the approach, whereas our approach plate says September 10th of 2020. So. At least the last time it was updated. We're valid from October 6th, actually a couple days ago, all the way up to November 3rd. And so, guys, this is a perfect example of 90% of what you're going to do if you're flying an actual aircraft, or even just perfect example, flying an aircraft in the sim. You get everything set up, you monitor it, double check that it's uh, accurate, and then you just sit there and do nothing. <laughs> So, you're welcome to aviation. The most boring job in the world until it isn't boring. 
and uh, then you're shrieking and uh, screaming and trying to not die. I'm trying to think of a story or something to tell. Um, one of the most <laughs> horrific feelings and horrific experiences I ever had in a helicopter it was back when I was a flight instructor. And I was instructing in the Robinson R-22, which is a, a very small, lightweight, extremely low inertia rotor system helicopter. So uh, there's actually special flight restrictions on that aircraft because when it initially came out, people were killing themselves left and right. So there are certain procedures and maneuvers that you have to demonstrate proficiency in. Um, and one of those, uh, to, to maintain currency in the aircraft and to get qualified to fly it, um, one of those is just entering an auto rotation. Um, one of the most simple, basic, and necessary skills as an autopilot, or autopilot, <laughs> as a helicopter pilot. <laughs> Sorry, once again, on my second Red Bull. But uh, <laughs> I was uh, demoing auto rotations for, uh, for one of my students one day. And to give you an idea, I was about 140 to 150 pounds at the time. This guy was a solid 220. He wasn't fat. He was just a built guy. And in the R22, when you chop the throttle, if you don't get your collective down, if you don't take all the drag out of that rotor system immediately, you have very big problems. <laughs> uh, problems you can't fix. Problems which result in the helicopter literally falling out of the sky like a brick. Um, it was still a little bit of a drag, so maybe not as fast as a brick, but darn close. Basically, you're, you're a lawn dart at that point. Anyway, you teach the student the right thing to do, and as a flight instructor, you are prepared in, in case they do the wrong thing. And the absolute wrong thing in that situation is to raise the collective, put more pitch, more drag on the blades, because that's going to slow them down even further. So that's one of the things you you beat into the student is in a power off, you know, a engine failure scenario, something like that, lower the collective right pedal little half cycling okay <laughs> but i digress so as the instructor you are prepared for the student to do the wrong thing well in this case it was the absolute worst because i was prepared for the student to raise the collective this is one of his first autos that he was going to enter on his own um, or do something else stupid well what i didn't expect was for this 220 pound muscle bound guy to completely freeze on the controls. And not freeze, but lock the controls. So not only was he not doing anything, it was completely preventing me from fixing the situation. So there we are, a few thousand feet above the ground, with the engine basically drawn down to idle. And it took my entire body weight to get that collective down. I remember physically lifting myself out of the seat against my seat belts to override <laughs> him locking up on the controls. Um, that was probably, oh, mother, this is a mom warning. If you're watching, uh, mute for the next 30 seconds <clears throat> and go. So that was probably the most terrifying moment of my life in a helicopter. We were about a quarter second to a half a second from being a lawn dart, because had that rotor RPM decayed just a little bit more, we would have not been able to get out of it. Anyway, okay, mom, you can listen now again. Ooh, that was a close one. <sighs> anyway, back to our approach. So it is going to take us to Slay's intersection. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that uh, maybe the nav database is a little bit different on this aircraft. But let's go ahead and slow down. We're about two minutes from Slay's. Let's see if we can get about 80 knots, which is going to extend our flight time. But I want to get the aircraft set up just right for us. Give our, if we slow down, it's going to give, our, uh, give us a lot more time to fix things. I just noticed, too, once we hit slaves, we're going to descend to 3,500 feet. So I'm going to try to get the autopilot to do that for us, but I'm not 100% up on uh, 
getting this autopilot to work. So we'll we'll see. <laughs> and when I say 80 knots, I'm going off my indicated airspeed. I'm going to ignore our ground speed here. I may point something out with a ground speed uh, a little bit further on when we're on the glide slope, but <clears throat> we don't need to worry about that now. And also, as I mentioned before, I was a helicopter CFI and CFII, not an airplane. So the biggest thing for me in an airplane is knowing when to <laughs> deploy landing gear and flaps and all that stuff. So we're going to have to change our heading bug here. Anyway, back to what I was saying. I'll, I'll probably deploy, deploy flaps at the incorrect time and place, but sorry about that. 30 seconds of slays. Let's bring this in. Right turn to 016. I think that's 016. Glad it didn't take us through the. Uh, We do also need to descend to 3,500 feet. So I'm going to hit VS. Do 400. I'm doing a lot right here. I'm going to put a notch of flaps in. I'm going to switch this over to the localizer automatically. That's awesome. So let's hit approach. A lot just happened right there, and I didn't explain it very well. My apologies for that. Having uh, put the autopilot into approach mode, that should... That should tell it to intercept the uh, glide slope. Thousand feet to go, to 3,500. I'd like to be level at 3,500 before we hit Karzi. Looks like Karzi is going to be our final approach fix. I hope I'm getting that term right. I said it's it's been a long time since I've officially been in the IFR system. Um, any IFR flying that I do, uh, I'm still a commercial helicopter pilot. That's my main profession uh, in the helicopter EMS world, but. So any IFR flying that I do is basically um, save your own ass VFR helicopter in instrument conditions inadvertently. So it's all local area stuff. I've got my local uh, ILS basically memorized. That's why I fly mostly the uh, Las Cruces ILS 3.0 because that's the one I need to practice and know the most. Like I said, it is basically memorized for me because if I'm in actual IFR conditions at work, oof. <laughs> That's dangerous. So same thing that we did leveling off at 5,000 feet. We'll just slowly decrease our uh, our rate of descent here to get us at 3,500. And as we do that, we're going to have to excuse me uh, increase power because as we level out, our airspeed's going to drop. Especially if we got uh, one notch of flaps in. You know what? While we're descending, I'm going to put our second notch of flaps in. Do that before we hit our uh, glide slope.
Yeah, so my approach... Oh, shoot, I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we're going to hit altitude hold here. And I think I will have to cycle through altitude in just a second, but uh, sorry, I forgot our 3,500 feet and our throttle. Oh, I'm getting behind the airplane. Not good. Okay. So right now we're in altitude hold. We actually don't want that for this approach. We want our glide slope, um, which is this bad boy, this horizontal line right here. So our localizer tells us laterally, like if we're lined up with the runway or not, and the glide slope, this vertical, I'm sorry, horizontal line tells us if we're uh, descending at the, at the proper rate. So let's tap this altitude button one more time, and that's telling it that we want it to grab the glide slope when we get there. So that frees up altitude mode once we've intercepted the glide slope. And I am going to take one more minute to, to mention that I believe the nav database that we're using in the sim is different from the actual approach plate we're looking at because my approach plate says a final approach course of 014 and we're clearly flying a 016 so this is probably a few years out of date the data database in the sim I wish they would update that stuff um, I think Navigraph I think that's the the name of the company they I believe it's a subscription service but they'll uh, it, it automatically updates it to the, to the most new, the most newest, <laughs> to the uh, the most current stuff here. Okay, as we approach Carzi, you'll see our glide slope coming down. The autopilot should trip over and intercept the autopilot. Let's watch down here and make sure it does flip over. There it goes, glide slope. Okay, we can reduce our power a little bit again here. As we descend, we're going to gain airspeed. Mind your trim. That beeping is our outer marker. Which I don't think those are really, I don't know, in the civilian world, used that much anymore. I know that the one at, in Las Cruces has been disabled. So I've flown that approach a million times in real life, and I don't need that anymore. Okay, so it looks like we made it to Norfolk. <sighs> What's our decision altitude? 1,773 feet. That is 200 feet AGL. And since we're on our final approach, I'm going to hit the heading... Uh, or sorry, compass card again. Just realign that a little bit. But as you can see, we are... Autopilot's got us lined up with the runway out here. And there's something about flying IFR. Like, technically, we wouldn't have needed to see outside for this entire flight. Um, the reason I didn't put us in actual IFR conditions is just so you can see, you know, the process like this. You could see us fly over the Columbus Airport and VOR. You can see us lined up with the runway. In fact, when I was a double I, I would do that with all my my students. Anytime we would try a new approach or anytime they requested, I'd have them flip up the hood so they can see outside and they could actually see where they are, give them that uh, situational awareness so that when they are in the soup, when they are under IFR, under the hood, anything like that, uh, they have a better understanding of what it actually looks like outside the aircraft compared to the chart and your instruments. <clears throat> Seventeen seventy-three. I'm gonna call it eighteen hundred feet. Will be our decision altitude. And uh, I gotta be completely honest with you guys. I do not know how to turn off <laughs> the autopilot in this aircraft. So I may fumble with that when we hit eighteen hundred feet. We'll <laughs> we'll see. And I do apologize for uh, whatever 
disaster this landing is going to be. Because <laughs> it's probably not going to be pretty. Okay, about 400 feet from our DA. A little fast, but we're lined up and on a localizer and the glide slope. We can actually see the Oh shoot, I forgot what that was called. Is that a PAPI? Precision Approach Path Indicator? Our lights there. <laughs> Sometimes BK's the dumb. Okay, final notch flaps. And that's gonna kick us up above the glide slope probably. I don't know the autopilot handled that very well. Alright. Here's our eighteen hundred feet. I'm going to Okay, I think we're decoupled. I'm gonna try to land this airplane. <laughs> Remember, I'm a helicopter pilot, guys. <laughs> and I always have a tendency to line up on the right side of the runway. Like, always. It's, it's hilarious. Well, we made it down. Um, thanks for watching. I hope that, like, opened the door a little bit to operating the Garmin 530 and the autopilot in the uh, Steam Gauge 172. Once again, most important thing being that uh, heading bug on your compass card. So, <sighs> You have to have the heading bug aligned with whatever course you want to be on. That's the biggest takeaway I can give you guys, plus the uh, the little trick of lining up the compass card um, itself. So, hope you enjoyed. If you have any uh, requests or anything, uh, I really enjoy doing this. I don't know if I'm the best uh, like presenter. Um, once again, I can't officially give you guys instruction because I'm not the CFI anymore. But uh, yeah, I have fun doing these. So hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something and leave a comment. Thanks.